If you listen to the show, you already know that we cannot exist without our sponsors. They are the ones who make things happen behind the scenes. So let's acknowledge Fuji Sports. We've been working with these guys for a while now, not only as far as this podcast is concerned, but also at the Roll Academy. We've had their gear. I personally use their geese. What a phenomenal product. Yeah, I mean, jujitsu, judo, MMA, um, tape, bags, anything you need for your jujitsu journey you can find at fujisports.com. Let's talk Roll TV. There's so much content on there. It's ridiculous at this point. But I think what is even more intriguing, as time went on during the project, we've been recording most of the events that were taking place here at Roll Academy. At this point, I mean, we have guys like Chris Howder, Armin Fadi, Rafael Lovato Sr., and, and Pete the Greek. I mean, there are so many different events that we've kind of recorded it. Don't you think that's amazing? I mean, it's points of reflection and kind of going back for all the students to see what really happened and refresh their memory. Yeah, I think it's great, you know, being able to go back and look at all these high-level practitioners, uh, Octavio Kudo, like uh, one of the names you didn't mention. And I mean, just these guys that have been doing this for so long come in, uh, teach these amazing seminars and workshops, and it's all recorded and there for you to watch. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to get an additional savings on all this, type in code ROW Radio at the coupon and get additional 30% off of your membership. Nice. Go to rollacademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please hit the like, share, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. This ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you've come to expect. Today's guest joins the show to discuss her journey of self-discovery through jiu-jitsu, the distinction between training hard and rolling hard, the importance of community and mentorship, and more. Dorothy Dow. Welcome to Raw Radio. And we are live. Another phenomenal conversation. Today we have Dorothy Dow in the, in the house in the, in, on the episode. Dorothy, thank you for being here. And thank you for accommodating because you are 12 hours apart from us, technically, all the way on the other side of the globe. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me on and no problem. I just got here, so I don't even know what time it is in my head right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of moving around for you, but that's what your life has been, hasn't it? A lot of traveling, a lot of exploring, a lot of kind of enjoying life. Yeah, for sure. Um, sometimes I think I live a pretty selfish existence, but, you know, I, I don't regret Why much. do you say that? Why do you say selfish? Um, I feel like a lot of my life choices have been pretty, like, self-serving, not in a bad way. But, like, it's just, like, I'm truly enjoying, like, every moment of it. Um, and I feel like a lot of people maybe don't, but like I, all my decisions leading up to now have been like to ensure my own happiness. So that's, that's what I mean. It's not necessarily negative. But isn't, isn't happiness in some sense selfish? I mean, we need to bring certain level of satisfaction to us, not to mm -hmm. others. And by definition of itself, we got to look at what's best for us. No, totally. Um, again, I, I don't mean it in a negative way. It's just like, yeah. uh, it's just a thought I've had over the years. You know, and as I was preparing for this conversation, I, I, I noticed one thing that you said at one of the reviews, I don't know what it was, but, um, you said, I just left everything I care about and I'm so sad that life as I know it is over. Was that a point? Do you remember saying this? The number one? Uh, oh no! It, it, it was when it, when you were leaving San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. But have you ever had the point of regret that you left everything? And we'll get to the story. I'm just kind of fast forwarding to the to to, to the you know meat and potatoes of this whole thing. But um, have you ever had a regret of point of I left everything as I had it, and and now I I have to let it go? No, never. Um, I mean, like you. there's there's moments of sadness in like in the present but um when i look back on my life thus far 
um, I, I can't regret anything. I'm pretty happy with where I'm at right now. Good. Well, good for you. Good for you. Thanks. Let's, 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 let's rewind. Let's get to okay. the beginning of this. <laughs> let's get to the beginning of this. There's You've been on the mat for so quite far. a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've been on the mat for quite a bit. Um, great journey. A lot of success in jiu-jitsu. Um, a lot of success in life. And obviously, you appear as, as a very happy person from, from a life achievement perspective. Where did this all start? Why, why jiu-jitsu? Why, how did you stumble upon this beautiful thing that we all love and we cherish so much? And honestly, that thing gave you what you have today. So how did this all start? Um, so I started training kind of late, late for uh, a competitor, I guess. At, I think I was like, I had just turned 20 um, or 19. Yeah, end of 19, 20. I was, I had just finished or I was finishing college. Um, and I did the typical American college thing, you know, like went to school, partied a lot, um, got kind of fat, you know. <laughs> Got a little depressed looking for some activity. And uh, I think one winter break, I found a free jiu-jitsu trial when I was at my parents' house. And um, I showed up and I didn't like it that much, but it was hard and it made me super sore. So I just kept going. Um, and for some reason, I just like did it a little inconsistently. And then I did my last semester of college um, in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, that was my first like international travel experience. And that's when it really like hit me that I really liked this. It was my main way of making friends who are local. Um, so that's when I started training every day. And that was about six months in. Okay. So hold on, hold on, because you fast forward, like <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> a lot here. I want to dig into this because your okay, story, okay. your story is truly extraordinary in my mind, at least. So you find, so, so you live college lifestyle essentially life is yeah. good party is on and then why jiu-jitsu why why you said you stumbled upon it but what what was about jiu-jitsu that made you go to that first class so i had always done team sports growing up like i played soccer i guess tennis is not a team sport but like it it, it doesn't count in my mind but i always felt like i was a bit i needed something a bit more aggressive <laughs> Like the way okay. I used to play soccer is very like indicative of a, I would enjoy a combat sport. Um, so I looked up, I think I was looking up Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu. I didn't know what Jiu Jitsu was. So it just, I was like, oh, free. So I, I went because <laughs> it was. Oh, free. I see. So they got you yeah. into the marketing thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 So free trials do work. Um, and then I think. There, you know how there's like a learning curve, right? The first like six months, you just like have no idea what's going on, especially like at that point in my life, I was not athletic at all. Um, and I think what drew me in was just everyone in that gym was super friendly and supportive of me. And at that point in my life, that's what I really needed. Um, so I think it was more the people than the sport itself that drew me in at first. And, um, you know, gradually as my competence kind of increased, the sport did keep me, but initially and still, it's the people in the sport. Would you agree that the community, the people, is one of the most important things in jiu-jitsu now after all these years doing it? 100%. Like, I would not be where I am today without the people. Yeah. Isn't that interesting how we do something, yet that's not the core reason why we are there? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're humans. Like, we're very social creatures, even if most of us are can be like introverted. Um, so yeah, like I think before I had a lot of social anxiety and for some reason, um, when I step on the mats or within this community that dissipates completely. So I'm actually a very extroverted person in jujitsu, but outside I would rather just stay in my house. Yeah. I can't relate to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned something a moment ago that it, it, it you were not, attached to it the jiu-jitsu was not the draw at the very beginning for first six months or so i think you said and then it starts turning around it, 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 you you start gaining confidence in it you start learning a little bit more is there a specific pivot point in when that starts happening where jiu-jitsu becomes actually an interest for you yeah. So like I said, I did my last semester in Cape Town and I really wanted to make local friends. 
Um, so that's when I started training consistently and I'm a highly competitive person at heart like mm-hmm. everything I do. So when, once I kind of passed that threshold of understanding what the heck this is we're doing on the ground, <laughs> um, then I started getting really competitive. And I did my first competition um, as a white belt in Cape Town. And then when I got back, uh, my home gym is in Berkeley, California, in the Bay. Um, I just kind of kept competing and got really into the gym there. Go back to the first six months. Um mm-hmm. Walking into a gym or academy or stepping onto the mat as female, one, it's not easy. I already know this. I talk to many females, but I, I would imagine you had a similar experience. Two, it appears to me as jujitsu is not your focal point and you don't know anybody there. Mm-hmm. You're introvert by definition. Everything tells me here that you're going against the grain here. Like, why are you, what what drives you to step in and continue this for the first six months when you are, well, let's just say there is a point of insecurity. There, there, there is anxiety, some, some anxiety associated with it, I would imagine at least. Like, and you're not the biggest person in the world. Like, you know, as I'm reading, I mean, from your competition, Life Feather, I mean, you are little, right? So like, how do you deal with all of this? You know, social anxiety, connection with people, you know, being smaller, in the room, plus being female in a male-dominated sport, what goes through your mind? Like, how do you process this? So I would say I, um, my personal experience has been, it's almost been easier for me as a female to go into these rooms because first, Cape Town is not a safe place necessarily. So like the second I stepped into the gym um, at Hensel Gracie Cape Town, they were just like, what the heck is this Asian chick doing here by herself? <laughs> like, how did you get here? <laughs> and then they, were, they just made sure that I was safe. You know, like it was immediately like, oh, my God, let's not have her die on our watch. <laughs> so like, <laughs> there's that. Um, and I've kind of found that traveling around, you definitely stand out more as a female. Um, of course, there are cons to that as well but for the most part I found that it opens more doors for me being a female um just because the reality is you do get more attention walking into a room especially like back then 10 years ago when there were even fewer females in the sport um I didn't find that necessarily to be a negative and was was that protective circle the community that you're describing was that the instant welcome in you're part of the pack you don't have to prove yourself we got your back was that the driver for the first six months to keep you in there? A hundred percent. And at that time, like I, it was like the one hobby I had that kind of was different from my current, my friend group at the time, you know, it was like my thing. And, and it was just something like I could escape to whenever I felt like. So now what, what are your friends? What are your party friends? thinking about all of this because this is very different from from the previous life that you you you're switching away from right yeah well i am totally indoctrinated now and i don't really talk to people who don't train (laughs) (laughs) so i don't know i don't know what they think it's funny because that was my next question like do you even keep in touch or know anybody outside of jiu-jitsu circle because i can honestly say that like even if I do know somebody from outside of Jiu-Jitsu circle, like my attention span for the conversation is so much shorter than, than the Jiu-Jitsu people. So um, how do you feel about that? Oh, for sure. It's, it's very different. I mean, I have met up with like various friends from different stages of my life over the years. And they're just like, wow, your life took a 180. Um, like I was supposed sure to be like working in the United Nations, like president of something, you know, um, I was a pretty high achiever back in school. Um, so, and not athletic at all. So like now I'm an athlete kind of, uh, so yeah, I, I can't, I can't say like, I regularly keep in contact with many jujitsu people or not non jujitsu people, but like at I also just like don't keep in contact with many people in general. Like it's like my current circle is my current circle, you know. Was the education important to you as you were going through these beginning stages of jiu-jitsu and, um, you know, um, going through your college years? You said you were overachiever 
you mentioned national uh, United Nation and and other things, right? So like, was that important at that point of time? The education achievement and and driving and pushing forward, being somebody, doing something, um, and I mean this in quotes, but you know what I mean. For sure. Um... And yes, like I am clearly of Asian descent and my parents are immigrants and they they have a very traditional immigrant mindset and they always pushed me to, you know, doctor, lawyer. And I I was going to go to law school. Um, I decided not to at some point. But yeah, like at that point in my life, like I had to excel in everything and eventually I just burned out. And that's when I kind of decided to like embark on this path instead of, you know, the JD path. Do you think that this was an escape from um, some of that stress pressure of, you know, society or family or, you know, whatever might be of the image of you need to achieve something? Oh, a hundred percent. I think that's like the reality of how things are for most of us who train a lot. Like it, it is an escape. It's like a forced, like mindfulness practice, you know, like it's stress relief um, for competitors, for non, especially for non-competitors. Um, yeah, it was a total escape. Um, how was that conversation with your parents when you told <laughs> them that <laughs> you're not going to be a lawyer, you're going to do jujitsu for a living? <laughs> So I never told them I, well, I don't do jujitsu for a living. Like I don't really make money off jujitsu. I kind of own my own business on the side, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. So I had well, you graduated. Know, you know what I mean? There, there is a path, yeah. career path change here. <laughs> yeah. So it co- it's interesting. It coincided with another big life decision. Like I, after college, I graduated I was working as a paralegal in San Francisco for a couple of years before I intended to go to law school. And after seeing how, you know, working in a big law firm is, I decided, no, cannot. Um, And funny enough, I had gone to Thailand for my first solo trip and met a bunch of jiu-jitsu people who do kind of what I'm doing now. Like they are entrepreneurs, they train, all the time have super flexible schedules and i was like why why can't i do that like i need to try to do this so that's when i decided like okay i'm going to figure this out i quit my job decided i'm moving to china to shanghai and then i think like a week or two before the actual move i called my dad <laughs> and i was like hey like i'm not going to do this anymore i'm going to go to school in china to learn Chinese, (laughs) but that wasn't actually like the reality of things, you know? So obviously they were concerned um, and they still are. What, what was the response? (laughs) Silence. (laughs) Okay, Um, (laughs) fair enough. That says it all, right? (laughs) Yeah. 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 I mean, at that point I was financially independent, so they couldn't really like control me in that way. So I was just like, Hey, by the way, I'm going, you know, Feel free to call me if you want, but if not, all good. Are your parents the first generation of the immigrants to U.S.? Yes, they came after the Vietnam War. They're from Vietnam. Um, And to their credit, they have adapted a lot more than some other immigrant families that I've seen. So now we're in a pretty good spot, but obviously that call was bad. Well, but the reason why I'm asking this you know, I'm a first generation of my immigrants to U.S. So I, I mm-hmm. know, and my father has gone above and beyond in his life to set me and, you know, for success and set the family for success. So I, I can only imagine what your parents have gone through. And I think some of these decisions are very hard. Doing everything you can for your kids. Yep. And then your child goes, uh, you know, never mind. I'm going to go do this way, you know, and totally. so just emotionally, this is, this must be very difficult for your parents. I'm curious what your approach, emotional approach was to us. Were you concerned that they're going to be like, ah, uh, no, you're going to law school. Or did you think that it's going to be like, yeah, I mean, Dorothy, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, life is good. You know, you just take care of yourself. What, 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 what was your train of thoughts? Definitely. I knew they weren't going to give me the second option. Um, <laughs> 
I mean, like over the years up until that point, I think I was 23 at the time. I was just mm -hmm. like, look, I have to frame this as in I'm going to school to learn Chinese, which is a useful skill. Um, I was like, I'm going to look into getting into the import export trade because at the time the Chinese economy was booming. You know, yeah. it, it was a real like interest of mine, like just get there meet people like network and figure it out and at first they were they were like scared and they were like we worked so hard to get out of asia why are you going back mm -hmm. um so yeah I, kn I knew it would be a huge point of contention um but at the end of the day i had worked really hard to become financially independent as early as i could so it was more of just like a Hey, I'm doing this, not like a hey, can I do this? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. and of course the guilt follows you. Like Asian guilt is a total thing. Um is it? I, oh, totally. And it, they're not shy about like doling it out either. They're like, I worked so hard. <laughs> How could you do this to me? Um, so yeah, like it's it was hard. Like I see a lot of the parents now for the young kids, like they're so supportive. And I can't say I ever had that in that way but they supported me in a lot of other ways that I'm forever grateful for. Well, I always say, I tell my kids and, and all the students even here, the, the kids, students here at the Academy is, is what we do and the circumstances we surround ourselves with is what builds us to be uh, who we are. So, you know, if your parents haven't done what they've done, you, who knows where you would be? Like it, it just, life would pivot in a very different direction. Speaking of pivots, have you ever thought about the simple fact if you didn't step into that Jiu-Jitsu Academy for the very mm -hmm. first time, that your life would look completely different today? I would be an alcoholic lawyer, like very good at my job, but like I, I would be miserable. Like I, that's what I saw working at that law firm. Um, high achievers work, you know, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and it was just not something I could be okay doing the rest of my life. Um, so I, I saw what I was going to be like. And in fact, like I see it now too, even people who train jujitsu, like it exposes you to a lot of different age groups. Mm -hmm. So I kind of saw people who are already stuck in that rut in their thirties, forties, fifties. So I was just like, I can't do this. Like I need to figure out something else. And I was also young. I graduated young. So I was like, if I go try this and I, you know, mess up for a year or two, like mm -hmm. I'm still 25, like it's okay. And I think that's the interesting part about your story particularly is the fact that most people have this aha moment way later in their life, in their 30s, sometimes in their 40s or 50s. Like they, they've go, they go through this entire career and they, after a decade or two, they're like, oh, this is crap. I'm going to change this. And I've had many of these conversations, even from my students, you know, trying to change careers, trying to change the path of their life. But you take very proactive approach to all of this. You notice things very quickly. You're just like, oh, crap, I don't want to work 10, 12 hours a day. I don't want to deal with this corporate politics and doing all of this. I, I want to be more free. Where do you think this recognition point comes from? Is that something that was embedded by your parents? Something that comes naturally to you? Like, wh how do you notice that? Like, I don't know one 20 year old who will be, who had that point of intelligence in a sense to say, yeah, this is not going, I'm just going to give all this up against everything my parents were telling me and I'm going to go and do my own thing now. I think it comes from a place of one, like rebellion. Like, I was a very rebellious kid. And, uh, oh, is that right? It in, now in I'm a way, ask you stories that will be rebellious. <laughs> no, not not bad. Like just like in my head, I was like, yeah. I need to get out of here. Um, so I always wanted to leave the traditional path. Um, and after seeing how bad it could be, I, it just reinforced it more. And then once I started training at my gym in Berkeley, I ended up being like best friends with just like a bunch of middle aged dudes. And, uh, <laughs> and some of them were like, they gave me a lot of good life perspective. And, uh, especially one of my best friends, I think he's like 50 something now, but like, he is also an entrepreneur and, uh, he really helped me kind of rationalize my thought process and what I was doing and just gave me perspective from an older person, um, and reassured me that it would be okay if I kind of made that leap. 
Well, good for you. I think we all yeah. need those people to look up to. We all need the leaders in some shape or capacity. They come in different, different places of our life and with different purpose, but they are so important. Mm -hmm. And now you are a black belt. You teach, you travel, you engage with many thousands of people all around the world at different points of time, and you play that role. Have you ever thought about that, that you are the leader they look up to? Kind of. Like, I, I feel like I see my effect on certain people, especially girls sometimes, but I don't, it, it makes me feel weird about stepping into that role for other people. Like, I'm happy Why? to tell my story. I just feel like I'm still growing up and I'm still living out my life. So it's not my place to preach to others how to do things. Like, people ask me for advice a lot on how to live this lifestyle, you know? And honestly, like, I don't know if I could necessarily like recommend it to other people just because I know how unstable it can be and how scary it can be at times. Um, so yeah, like I what? understand I'm in leadership role, but it's not something I embrace yet. What, what's so scary? Um, instability. Like when I first moved away, it's not like I had like a ton of savings, um, so I was really like, you know, I was roughing it for a few years, just totally like, man, like I might have to go home with my tail in between my legs and apologize. Um, but for some reason I, you know, you figure out ways to survive and, um, that, yeah, basically that. And I don't know if I wouldn't wish that upon anyone, you know, like I, I but, wish, yeah. But, but wait a minute. You're talking about roughing it out. How is that any different than working 12 hours a week or 12 hours a day and roughing out a law firm? How is that any different than going, being compliant with the rules that you disagree with because you incorporate life and you have to follow the things that you don't want to and now you are free? But, well, it's not, it's not unicorns and rainbows all the time. How is that any different? It's a trade-off. I wouldn't say it's different, but I think mm -hmm. um, the grass is always greener on the other side or sometimes yeah, greener okay. on the other side. Um, no, like it's not a fun feeling being financially unstable in a foreign country yeah. where you're not necessarily allowed to work. Um, you know, like yeah. there, there's a lot of gray areas that I kind of tread and it was, it was challenging. It, it made me grow up a lot. And yeah, so I, it's like, let's say, would I give this advice to my little sister? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, do not do what I did, you know, like you might die. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I encourage people to go on their own adventures, but I never tell them to follow what I did exactly. Fair enough. I yeah. think that's fair enough. I think that's yeah. fair. But listen, by you being here and sharing your story gives people a perspective, whether hard or not hard, challenging or not challenging, worth it or not, that's for them to determine you're here to share your story, and for that, I do appreciate. Let's pivot mm -hmm. this to jujitsu a little bit. Okay. Um, you go through this jujitsu journey. You compete. You train. It, it, it clearly is clear to me that it, it's it becomes an outlet, not only mentally but also physically. You 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 change a lot of things in your life, and mm -hmm. are you using this as a vehicle to to be healthy and get better, and so on. But none of this changes the fact that you go through a lot of academies, you, you travel a lot, you visit a lot of places. And again, I'm going to go back to being a small female. How is that being, how is that impact you with your jujitsu? Is that easy or is that hard? So I feel like I've only started understanding how small I am recently. <laughs> Oh, okay. Like, yeah, I don't know if it's an age thing or I, I don't know, but I feel the weight difference is a lot more now than I did back then. Like back then, I would just dive headfirst into like basically any role. Um, and I had to learn slowly over time. There are people who are not safe or, you know, learn how to be vocal about it, but I'd still do it and not mind it. But nowadays, especially after the past couple of years, uh, I'm I'm a lot more cautious and hesitant to you know roll with Why? different size people. Why? I've had so many injuries. <laughs> like is I that, would, okay, so let me ask you yeah. this: Is that yeah. because you're small, or is that because you used to dive head head first? 
Oh, both. I have a black eye right now, but I covered it up, so you can't. Okay, so see, now you said it, I got to ask you, what's the story? How did that happen? (laughs) I mean, I I get black eyes a lot, but like this one was from the Bali camp. I just did uh, just just rolling, you know, knee slice. Just rolling, just accidental knee to the face. I mean, it's just like every day in the office, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you get a lot of comments? And, and I'm going to change this here for a second. But do you get a lot of comments about black eyes, bruised cuts, but you know all the little aches and pains that come with jujitsu as we know it? Do you get a lot of questions from other people about this? I get a lot of questions when I have black eyes currently, but as to why I get them so often. But like in terms of injuries, like we're all you know aching, you know. Yeah. So there's a lot I, of I'm not there. I'm not qualified to like talk about how to rehab your injuries or anything so are you yeah. are you one of those individuals who will just go and train there is a bruises and aches and pains and you just put ice on it and you you just move on from it oh yeah like uh more so before than or actually no yeah i i am <laughs> like <Yeah>. 100%. <laughs> i tell people i'm like i'm do as i say not as i do <laughs> Fair enough. I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's yeah, fair. Yeah. All right. So we were talking about being small female and you being now selective about who you train with. Let's take let's take a small step back from this. There, there is enormous population of women who might be interested in jujitsu, but they are mm-hmm. they have fear of even even remotely trying this. For, for many reasons. One, physical contact. Two, male-dominated sports. Sweat is another one that I heal oftentimes, yeah. you know, and, and like, you know, I don't want to be touched. All these are valid reasons, right? And like, as I'm listening to you, I mean, you might be a little crazy and all that, but like, I'm listening to you and you're like, who cares about all this? Like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to grow. I'm going to, like, I don't care about this, right? So how do you overcome these things? And I would imagine there's a period of time where kind of we develop the you get desensitized to some of this, right? But like, mm-hmm. how do you process this from a female perspective? You walk into the room, if not everybody, probably 99% of people are bigger than you. Two, you don't care about bruises, aches, and pains, and wear and tear that comes with it. You just love it. Yeah. How do you get to that mindset? How do you overcome these obstacles for, for, for those who are listening. So I don't think I would have a great answer for that because I don't remember that ever being an obstacle. But I was like the women's coach at my gym in Shanghai. Um, mm-hmm. So I did have to navigate that for other people for a while, other women. Um, and I think when like, if, if women do have an issue with either like rolling with bigger people, guys, or, you know, sweat, I mean, sweat is sweat but like stinky sweat. Um, I think that's where my women's class was really helpful was getting them adjusted to like the sport until they were addicted enough to join the co-ed class. But Mm -hmm. um, me personally, I don't ever recall having an issue with that. I just kind of was like, okay, I guess we're rolling around in the dirt now and it was fine. Do you think that women only should train with women or the co-ed environment is a must? I think co-ed environments are good because like, like for the past year at AOJ, I pretty much only rolled with women, but that was because of, uh, for competition reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like most women get into jujitsu for self-defense or some other reason or just to enjoy. Um, so I, I, I don't like the idea of women only rolling with women. Like, I don't think it's realistic. I don't, I think it's like very closed off and I think like men should learn how to roll with women, you know, like it, you know, it it should be like a environment where like everyone is looking out for each other. Um, So like the point of, or like segregating a room based on gender is just kind of silly to me. I oftentimes, and this is just my personal perspective. I actually, I find difficult to train with, smaller individuals and i'm not even talking about women only but that Mm -hmm. particularly is often the case because of the physicality right but totally but i i find it harder because you girls can find small spaces and Mm -hmm. when i roll with guys i don't need to be concerned about the small spaces so by default i ignore them and and it is such a mind open and i think so many ignore this 
even just from that perspective, learning that skill, and it's vice versa the same way, what smaller individual might be dealing with carrying that weight or manipulating that weight or not being on the bottom, as simple as it is, like, you know, just turn to the side instead of being flat on the back. Like these are very simple principles. You know, we sometimes ignore them when, when the weight is not as, when the weight difference is not so much, so, so great. Is, wouldn't you agree? Oh, 100%. And um, that's kind of what I had to adjust a lot going into AOJ was my whole jujitsu journey. I'd rolled with mostly bigger people. Like I never was in a room where I had a ton of small girls my size to roll with. So my game was actually better suited to rolling with bigger people. Um, And I had a really hard time adjusting to like people who were shorter than me or smaller than me. Um, so I, I kind of get it. Like, I know I'm small, but like, I, I've had to make a lot of adjustments the past year. Isn't it interesting how some would view this as a benefit to you? Oh, you don't have to deal with the heavy guys anymore. And now you're describing, well, wait a minute, I have to change things now because I'm no longer training with these big guys. Isn't yeah. it interesting how jujitsu pivots and depending on the environment that we find ourselves in? Mm-hmm. And like, I have to be more technical now and not just like try to muscle (laughs) through everything. And actually like in the past year, a few girls have joined like black belt girls and it's been interesting watching them all say the same thing. They're like, Oh my God, I like use too much strength. I don't move enough. So it's like, it's a whole different game shift that you have to make to like compete with women your size. Interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. And now it's like, I have, yeah, sorry. Continue. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I, I was just saying, like, now I'm a bit more apprehensive about rolling with bigger guys. And, like, I'm kind of readjusting now that I've moved to Bangkok. Like, my game, so this, like, me- middle ground, you know, that works both ways. Yeah. Should, do you think we should be selective who we train with? 100%. Um, not, depends on, like, why you're being selective. Like, if you feel unsafe, 100%. But if someone's giving you a hard roll and you just don't like to lose, then that's that's your problem, <laughs> you know? And I've, I've definitely yeah. seen people avoid hard rolls, but, like, dangerous rolls are what I would avoid, not hard ones. There is a difference, isn't it? Hard roll versus dangerous roll? hmm How would you define that? Um, I'd say what really irks me is when someone I feel like someone's not able to sense pacing like like some people only have one speed and I don't know why that is if it's their personality I just got a flashback of a few names in my mind yes we all have a list of names you know um sometimes it's their personality sometimes they come from a gym where it's that's all they've known um so I try not to blame the individual and like I've had multiple people kind of ask me over the years like how like this person rolls too hard like can you talk to them and I was like why don't you just use your words like maybe they just don't know what's going on you know like like I would love someone to just tell me if like I'm going too hard you know I wouldn't take it the wrong way and if they do then that's a dangerous role you should not engage with that person but um yeah so there is a difference for sure do you roll hard I roll hard. I roll less hard now. I feel like after I got my black belt, I kind of mellowed out a lot. I always are apologize. You soft- are you softening down? Yeah. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> I always apologize to people for how I rolled with them when I was a purple belt. <laughs> oh, you're one of those? Yeah. <laughs> that, that was my blue belt times. I, I, was, yeah. I was a jerk. I was a jerk. Uh- I was crazy. I still am. Well, and okay, like, give yeah. give me a visual. Paint a picture here. Dorothy pur- purple belt. What what is going on? You and I, we are going, and what what's what, what's what's happening here? I just have to win. Like it's just oh, like really? I see red. Yeah, unless like, like over there's dead a body. Oh yeah, like yeah, um, and that's what I hate rolling with now. <laughs> <laughs> is that karma? Oh, totally. Um, I've been trying to tap back into that energy because I feel like it would actually help me a lot now. But it's just like, I don't know. I, I just but like... Expl- explain to me. What, what does that mean? You see red. You, what does that mean? You're hunting submissions? Are you are you smashing? Are you always on offense? What, what does this mean? You're standing up, you're down. You, what, what, is, what does this mean? What, what are you doing? What were you doing in the purple? 
driving forward all the time or like very just headstrong and like um yeah i i just like obviously submissions and everything but it was just like relentless and i feel like that's not necessarily a bad thing like i said i've been trying to like tap back into parts of that that i've lost but it's just unpleasant to roll with when that's like a hundred percent of the time where you you were that girl huh yeah that's why i got so injured <laughs> <laughs> But isn't that, isn't that kind of attitude makes us better in a sense that we are hunting, we are relentless, we, it, it, there, there is this very fine line being, be, being relentless and hunting versus being hurtful. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what makes us better, especially when we compete and you have competed quite a bit, especially in the blue and purple, right? I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that what we need to do? For sure. I, I don't think I was ever like hurtful or dangerous, but it was, it's just more like I, you can feel someone's energy when you roll with them. Mm -hmm. It sounds kind of woo woo, but you, you definitely mm -hmm. can. Um, and it's just like, now I feel like I can sense it so much more. And if someone rolled with me like that, I'm like, I don't like you. <laughs> like, <laughs> we can roll when I'm in the mood too, but like, I don't need this all the time. Like right now I'm just in the mode of like, I love this martial art and I want to play around and I want to train hard, but like, I don't want to feel like I'm going to be murdered. So, so, so let's, yeah. let, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because a lot of people I think misunderstand that. So in one sentence, you mentioned training hard and then rolling hard. And, and, and it appears to me as they are two different things by definition in your mind. What, what do you mean by each? What, what do they mean to you? I think training hard is like, you know, your standard, like competitive round, like you're both going 90 to 100 percent. But there comes a time where like, you're not even aware of what's going on around you. And I think that becomes dangerous. And I've seen, I see it almost every day, you know, like people bump into each other, people like hit each other and don't even realize. And that's, that's when I'm just like, I'm not going to be in this space right now. So why do that's you think kind that we are so, why do you think we are so unaware of these simple things in life? Fight or flight. Um, I think Survival? like, if, it's more like if we feel like we're under attack, we can't think properly, you know? Yeah. So it's just yeah. like, I'm trying to survive in this round or like, I'm so competitive. I only can see this. Um, and it becomes less of a art form, I guess, or like training. And it becomes more of like a, yeah, survival or like competition, which I don't think is always right for the training room. Yeah, somebody a while back told me that jiu-jitsu is like swimming in the ocean. If you just, you know, flap your arms all around, you go, you're going to go down. You're going under and the sharks will eat you. Like there's nothing in it. So you should just slow down, calm down, look around a little mm -hmm. bit and then make smart choices. Would you agree with that phrase? First, I totally thought you were going to say the shark thing. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> but, yeah, I'd say, like, yeah, when you can calm down a bit, um, you see a lot of solutions that you wouldn't before. And I kind of realized that a little later on. So, yeah. Why does it take so much time for us to realize these things? Why, why we need so many hours on the mats? to to simply be smarter and let's be honest about this many people who are higher ranked or more experienced they've told us these things probably all along the way and i'm sure you saying you're doing the same thing to your students you you tell them and and you know i could be wrong you tell me but i'm pretty sure that a lot of them don't listen to you and they have to experience this on on their own in a sense like they hear you but like yeah whatever and then you know they do their own thing why why are we are so stubborn as humans um, well, to be fair, I, I have met like quite a few beginners or people who haven't been training that long who do have a very good learning mindset. And I envy those people like that's great. But I think like when you're new at something, you only have like very small set of skills that you kind of understand. And your goal, your goal is simple. It's to win. So it's like, I only have X, Y, Z to win. So it's like, it's very like tunnel vision and you like even if you calm down 
you don't know what else there is. So like, I think over time, as you learn more, you start connecting the dots and then you can kind of see like, oh, this goes here. Or like, if I don't do this, this happens. So it's just more like a wider vocabulary helps. You said our goal is to win, but is it really the goal to win? No, not for me anymore. But like, I think initially when people go into combat sport, they're like, I need to win. I'm, I'm here to fight, you know, <laughs> but now and then it's... we become these white belt meatheads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, I don't blame them for being that way. You know, like, it's just like, it, it, it totally makes sense why it would be that way. Um, so well, it's a, cool seeing the process. In a sense, we using the skills that we have. Right. Longer we are doing jujitsu, more jujitsu we know, and more jujitsu we will be using. But at the very beginning, we don't know jujitsu, so the only thing we know is power, speed, and and explosiveness, and and that's essentially what we are resorting to. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think this is any different in any other sport. If we put somebody in a basketball, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to be running like crazy and pushing people around. You put people on rock climbing it's gonna be the same thing they're not gonna think about mechanics or gravity they're gonna think about how to climb as fast as they can so mm -hmm. it, it, it would you, you agree that this is a just very natural point in our the way how we process information to to be spazzy at the very beginning and the the, the trick would be to su suppress that in some way over a period of time and then start exploring this putting yourself in a vulnerable position Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so impressed when I walk into like gyms where the white belts aren't like that. I think it's a really good like reflection on the instructor. And I have walked into certain gyms where like they've taught really well how to learn and like what kind of mindset to go into class with. Um, so I have seen that play out in a more positive way. You've traveled a lot. You visited a lot of academies. Do you have a number? Do you keep track? How many academies you have visited? I like wrote it down a few years ago and I was already at like a hundred plus. Wow. Um, so I, I don't know the exact number now. <laughs> well, but even if we stick with that number, a hundred different academies, I'm sure you've seen a large diversity of mm -hmm. personalities, individuals, and jujitsu as a style. Which one is the most appealing to you or which one you are the most impressed with? I'm going to put you on the spot here. Out of the 100 plus, pick one. Is there one, let me rephrase this. Is there one you walked into, you spent an hour or two and you're like, damn, they did not expect this one. Yeah. Um, I'd say there's a few standouts. <laughs> Granted, like when I was dropping in on gyms, I was like a blue white belt. Like I, I didn't know what was going on, you know? Yeah. Um, but I want to give a shout out to my friend Gijo, who runs a gym in Colombia, Medellin. Uh, we lived there for like eight months. And I think the way he runs his program at a gym called Atlab, formerly Cobrina, uh, is really intelligent. Also, I was just training in Vegas before this um, at a gym called Jiu-Jitsu Methods with Rene Lopez. And I think they, they both teach really similar. Like it's a mix of, I know the ecological approach has been like all the hype in the past like couple of years and I also got super into it but I think their way of teaching is kind of a good mix and uh again what I said about the white belt thing like walking into a gym and feeling safe rolling with their white belts I think that's a really really great reflection of uh the instructor what would be the ideal way to teach or create that chemistry within the academy based on all everything that you've seen based of all your experience if you know you were to start something from scratch today how would you how would you approach this what would be the recipe um i'd have to sit down and think about this a bit more before i give like a proper answer but what i've oh, noticed come on. no no it's it's an important question um <laughs> but what <clears throat> i've noticed they both do is they really take time to sit and like explain the whys behind their positions and like it, it just facilitates like a curiosity like some gyms i walk in and people just want to show up and like kind of learn a technique roll sweat and leave which is great but if you really get your students excited about 
why these positions work. And um, it, it's just like, I've noticed their students really ask a lot of questions, smart questions. Um, so it's, it's just like all, all the class time is spent on learning, like in a really engaging way. Sorry, that's that's super generic, but no, like, no, no, yeah. no, no. This is this is actually very interesting. So what you're saying that we should be like be smart with jujitsu, like we should ask questions and like be intelligent about this, not like just come in, beat the crap out of each other and leave and go home. Yeah, like they would always show like a variety, like a position per class, but like a lot they delve into like different options, you know. And then they mm. give us space to kind of explore our own games within that. And I think that's also really important is to like give your students the space to kind of work on their own stuff. So it encourages outside study besides just like, oh, you are the Messiah. You tell me what to do. Like, I want to bring my own stuff into this too. But many instructors don't like that. Many instructors want to be the, on top of the foot chain and they want to be the guy or the girl and dictate what, what, what the students should do. And this is a right way and this is a wrong way. And it, it, isn't it that big part of the jiu-jitsu culture, or at least the old school jiu-jitsu culture that we, we witnessed? Yeah, the old school. And like, I, I came yeah. up under a very old school gym. Like I came up under Half Gracie and like, luckily, yeah. like my, my instructor over in Berkeley was pretty open-minded for that era, you know, but yeah, like, I don't like the old school way of like, I, this is my style. This is my gym. We're going to come here, learn this role. Let's not talk about anything else. <laughs> um, Do you think that there's a right or wrong way in jujitsu or? It's just different ways of interpretation. I think that there's so many different ways and everyone learns differently too. So how could there be a right way of teaching? Um, I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. So that's why I think it's really important yeah. to like keep things like kind of more open format, open-ended. The instructor can't stop learning. And I've seen a lot of instructors burn out, understandably so. Um, running a gym is really hard. And just like, you know, they stop learning. So their students stop learning. Are you still learning? I have to keep, I, I love, that's like, I don't want to teach because like, I want to keep learning <laughs> like, or actually, no, sorry. Those aren't like mutually exclusive, but like, I want to spend all my time learning and like to an, to an extent teaching does help me like, um, kind of really make sure I understand what is going on. But I, I don't think if I stop learning, I'll just quit jujitsu. Like, what's the point, you know, like. I know everything. Well, I mean, first, let me ask you, can you know everything? I mean, is that even a possibility in jiu-jitsu? No, I don't think so. I think it's almost infinite. Like, if you ask, like, the top guys in the mm -hmm. sport, like, if if someone tells you they know ju all of jiu-jitsu, like, there's a scam artist, you know? Like, there's no <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, there's, we got a few of those. Oh, but few, more than a few. few, few a, a month ago, a couple months ago, we have, I had, Aaron on the phone and I'm, I'm sorry on the show and he said something interesting he's been doing jiu-jitsu for, for a couple of decades he's a black belt in california and in burbank area and and he said that he never ever wants to own a jiu-jitsu academy because he feels that it would be a burden it becomes a job it becomes now he has to hustle now he has to worry about all these things and he simply wants to be a student Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that interesting coming from a black belt who's been on the, on the mat for so long? And I feel like a lot of people put this pressure or this goal. You become a black belt. Now you open your own place. Now you got to teach. Even if you don't have your place, you're obligated to teach. You're obligated to, to share. You're obligated to, you know, make your students better. And I feel like what you are describing and what he was saying is very similar. Like, I, I like I'm just not interested in any of this. I just want to learn. Yeah, for sure. Like I I love this sport. I love learning more about this sport and I made a very conscious decision decision a long time ago to not make money from this sport because I want it to not be my job. <laughs> so, I don't really make money off jujitsu at least like any meaningful amount and that i think has helped me not 
burn out on it in that way. Like I can't imagine being a full-time competitor and having my livelihood rely on my performance. Like it's stressful enough as it is. And I'd probably, I mean, I'd probably be a lot better at jujitsu if I could just train full-time, but like, I feel like it just would take away a lot of the joy I get from being on the mats doing it. And this past year, like I kind of played that role and I got to get a taste of why that happens. And like, yeah, I, I would totally fall out of love with it for a time period. What is that point of love or satisfaction that jujitsu brings you by being a student? I think it's just like understanding how infinite it is. And I, I think like just understanding more about anything you're passionate about is like very cool and it's a good feeling. And once you can start applying it again, it goes back into like our primal nature of like combat, like fighting. Um, it's, it's a very like, you know, dopamine, like, strong feeling when you can like apply what you've learned to like your body um so i i just like think it will never end as long as my body can hold up with it like i'll just keep learning and i i'm obsessed like you know it's it's a trade-off like some people who aren't full-time are like i wish i could be full-time and then people yeah. who aren't full-time are like i wish i had money uh, so yeah well, it's yeah. like what you said is grass is always greener on the other side. It's, yeah. it's a big part of life, right? Are you a dopamine junkie? Are, 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 you, are you a fighter? Are you like, do you, you need it. You, you, you got to have it. Oh, yeah. To an unhealthy degree at times. <laughs> to an unhealthy <laughs> degree. <laughs> yeah. Um, for sure. Like, I, and I think a lot of people are. Like, that's why, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it a lot. Like, people mm -hmm. get obsessed Mm -hmm. whether they're like 16 or 70 like they're all of a sudden like they weren't doing anything before and they're on the mats every single day like it's a very addictive thing and luckily it's generally good for your body <laughs> no i have um one of my students one of my black belts is in his 60s um and he you just described him like in your 60s you can't roll hard you can't roll a lot but he, the guy is completely, and shout out to Zook, he is completely obsessed with jiu-jitsu. Like, to the point where he will text me clips from different things and, and dissect. And, and the guy's been on the mat for decades. And, like, he's just dissecting things and asking this and this. And, like, it, it is so refreshing to see somebody with this healthy obsession about something good, right? Because ultimately we could be obsessed about who knows what and that turns into a bad things right mm -hmm. like jiu-jitsu can be obsessive or can be an addiction in a sense right yeah for sure i mean it can be destructive in that like people spend time on the mats that they should be spending time doing other things um which i'm certainly guilty of most of the time <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part i've found that it affects people like in a net positive way for sure good well that's phenomenal so you're in Bangkok currently. What's what's the plan? There is there a plan or are we are we completely shooting this off the hip? Because I don't know <laughs> I don't know where Dorothy is going these days. So what's uh what's the plan? So the plan is to kind of stay here longer term. Um the longer the... meaning like three weeks or longer like No, no, no. I'm not couple years. I'm not like a super nomad anymore. The past like year at AOJ the Signing a year lease in California was the wi wildest thing I've done in years. <laughs> like, it sounds weird to people, but I was like, oh, my God, I'm here. What does that mean? I need to commit months. to one place yeah. for a year, 12 months. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm, I'm definitely tiring out on doing the nomad thing. Um, it's been great, but I'm definitely looking to, like, kind of settle down a bit more in my old age <laughs> um, old age okay yeah, i'm 30 <laughs> <laughs> but no like i i've come to appreciate what's the the pros of stability so i'm i'm looking up to or i'm looking forward to kind of setting up a life here and seeing where it goes why but China? i'm also why why asia in general why why not us why why not somewhere else why not europe 
Um, Barcelona was definitely high on the list. Um, we lived there like uh, two years ago. Um, but I've, I have like strong ties to Asia. Um, I've been traveling through here for years and I just have like a strong social circle here. The U S, um, is very expensive. <laughs> and also it's just like, I don't know if you've been to Bangkok, but it's just like this crazy, unique, fast paced city, kind of like New York, but it's just I don't know, like it, it just draws me in a way that like other cities might not, but I'm definitely open-minded to moving other places in the future, but I don't want to be moving every six months now. Also like the visa situation is a lot easier to sort out here than it was before. Um, so, you know, there, there's just like logistical things that um, make Bangkok make sense. Well, good for you. Good for yeah. you. I mean, it's pretty clear that or, through this entire conversation, I'm noticing that there, there is a point of randomness in your life, which brings you happiness and joy. But at the same time, you making a strategic approach to all of this, and 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 it all has to make sense in some one point or another in order for you to pull the plug. So, I applaud you. My head goes off to you. Good for you. Many people struggle in their life, not doing what they want, and you truly living the dream. Um, at least from my perspective, would you agree? Are you? Are, do you find yourself like? A, do you? Do you feel like you're a lucky cat? I'm very lucky. Um, I'm definitely living my life. Um, but yeah, like I, I wake up every day and I'm just like, wow, I can't believe I survived and am living like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, I'm like incredulous. Like every morning I wake up, I'm like, wow, I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I'm waiting for like someone to pull out the rug from underneath me every day because like no, it, why, why I'm very aware yeah well good for you so far and and we'll be we'll be cheering on Dorothy before we um finish this we've been at this for over an hour but before we finish this I have a question for you from a previous guest now okay. he had no clue that you will be answering the question or who will be answering the question. So think of it as question and blind always creates an interesting end to the conversation. So uh, Nathan Levy asked, did you have a make or break moment in your life? And if so, what decision did you make to get moved past it? Um, That's deep. Well yeah i think we already covered it though like um it was definitely yeah. like the decision to like quit the law path and move to china yeah like because yeah. you know it was literally drop everything and just hope it works out <laughs> and it, yeah. it's well, still working out <laughs> it's still working out yeah. yeah it seems like it was a it seems like it was a good choice do these do these decisions do these points in your life where you have to make these hard choices and it's it's a fork where you have to go left or right, do they give you a sense of um, adrenaline rush? Do they give you a sense of like a dopamine dump where you're like, oh, yeah, let's, let, let's do this, even though it might not be the most supported decision from everybody else? I wouldn't say high dopamine. I would say high adrenaline for sure. Like adrenaline, it's risky. Yeah. I, I it's have risky. made yeah. I've made a lot of high-risk choices um, that have yeah. paid off. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like it, it's... There's a lot of like hard moments where, yeah, those decisions have to be made. Good for you. Good for you. I think we all live uh, very safe lives and um, taking Some risks is important. Some of us. Right. right yeah. Exactly. Some of us. <laughs> Dorothy, if anybody wants to connect with you, if any ladies out there listening or even guys listening out there and say, hey, listen, she is kind of crazy, but cool stuff. And, you know, we want to I, I want to dig in deeper and I mean, maybe I want to ask questions. I want to connect. Whatever the case might be, where are you at? Website, social media, where can anybody connect with you? And we'll make sure to put all the links in the show notes. But share, share, please share. Yeah, um, I'm pretty responsive on Instagram. So uh, it's kind of confusing, but my handle is not Dorothy Dow. Um, because <laughs> my initial Instagram got deleted a few years back. So I'm, now I'm not me. Um, so it's not underscore Dorothy Dow. Fair enough. Fair enough. And again, we'll put all the all the links in the show notes. Feel free to reach out to her. And Dorothy, thank you for one. Thank you for doing the cool stuff. I mean, truly, your story once again is is extraordinary. It's unique, and and my head goes off to you. I don't know if I could do what you do. 
But listen, it, it's it's cool to sit back and and watch you do all the amazing things. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for being vulnerable during this conversation and 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 engaging with me and sharing your wisdom and your experiences. It was been it's been a blast. No, thank you for having me on. It was super fun. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care. Thank you.